She looks up from the letter. You are Thane of Glamis and Caldor, and you're going to be king, just like you were promised. But I worry about whether or not you have what it takes to seize the crown. You are too full of the milk of human kindness to strike aggressively at your first opportunity. You want to be powerful, and you don't lack ambition, but you don't have the mean streak that these things call for. The things you want to do, you want to do like a good man. You don't want to cheat, yet you want what doesn't belong to you. There's something you want, but you're afraid to do what you need to do to get it. Um, you want it to be done for you. Hurry home so that hurry home so that I can persuade you and talk you out of whatever's keeping you from going after the crown. After all, fate and witchcraft both seem to want you to be the king. So a servant enters, and she says to him, What news do you bring? He says, The sir, the king is coming here tonight. You must be crazy to say that. Isn't Macbeth with the king? I wouldn't and wouldn't Macbeth have told me in advance so that I could prepare? If the king were really coming? The servant says, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Macbeth is coming. He sent a messenger ahead of him, who arrived here, so out of breath that he could barely speak his message. Take good care of him. He brings great news. The servant exits. So the messenger is short of breath, like a horse raven, as he announces Duncan's entrance into my fortress, where he will die. Come, you spirits, that assist murderous thoughts. Make me less like a woman and more like a man, and fill me from head to toe with deadly cruelty. Thicken my blood and clog up my veins so I won't feel remorse, so that no human compassion can stop my evil plan or prevent me from accomplishing it. Come to my female breast and turn my mother's milk into poisonous acid, you murdering demons, wherever you hide, invisible and waiting to do evil. Come, thick night, and cover the world in the darkest smoke of hell, so that my sharp knife can't see the wound it cuts open, and so heaven can't peep through the darkness and cry, No, stop. All right, so here, um, Lady Macbeth is calling to the spirits, the witches, to help her to be less like a woman and more like a man, to have the strength and the, and the thickness of skin to... Uh, do what she feels she needs to do and have the king murdered so that her husband can become king. So then Macbeth enters and she says to him, Great Thane of Glams, worthy Thane of Caldor, you'll soon be greater than both those titles once you become king. Your letter has transported me from the present moment when who knows what will happen and has made me feel like the future is already here. Macbeth says, my dearest love, Duncan is coming here tonight. And she says, when is he leaving? And he says, he plans to leave tomorrow. And she says, that day will never come. So she's saying, we're going to do it. We're going to do it tonight. We're going to get rid of him now. Your face, and she looks at him and she says, your face betrays strange feelings, my lord. And people will be able to read it like a book. In order to deceive them, you must appear the way they expect you to look. Greet the king with a welcoming expression. In your eyes, your hands, your words, you should look like an innocent flower, but be like the snake that hides underneath the flower. The king is coming, and he's got to be taken care of. Let me handle tonight's preparations, because tonight will change every night and day for the rest of our lives. And he says to her, We will speak about this further. So she, he hasn't s agreed, right? He's still... I don't know. So you should project a peaceful mood because if you look troubled, it will arouse suspicion. Leave all the rest to me in your mood. Right, so then the king arrives. The stage is lit by torches. Halt boys play. Duncan enters together with Malcolm, his son, Donald Bain, his other son, Banquo, Beth's friend, Lennox, Macduff, Ross, and Angus, who are all noblemen they're, and their attendants. Uh, Duncan says, this castle is a pleasant place. The air is sweet and appeals to my refined senses. Banquo. The fact that this, this summer bird, this house marlin, builds his nest here proves how inviting the breezes are. There isn't a single protrusion in the castle walls where these birds haven't built their hanging nests to sleep and breathe. I've noticed that they always like to settle and mate where the air is nicest. 
Okay, so they're saying it's a happy, quiet, beautiful palace. Uh, Lady Macbeth enters. Look here comes our honored hostess. Sometimes the love my subjects bring me is inconvenient, but I still accept it as love. In doing so, I am teaching you to thank me for the inconvenience I'm cause, causing you by being here because it comes from my love to you. And she says, everything we're doing for you, even if it were doubled and then doubled again, is nothing compared to the honors you have brought to our family. We gladly welcome you as our guest with gratitude for both the honors you've given us before and the new honors you've just given us. Duncan says, where is Macbeth, the Thane of Caldor? We followed closely after him. I hoped he, to arrive here before him, but he rides swiftly. And his great love, which is as sharp as his spur, helps him beat us here. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. And she says, we are your servants, your highness, and as always, our house and everything in it is at your disposal. For after all, we keep it in your trust, and we're glad to give it back when it, what's yours. So she's saying, you're our king, you own everything in the land, um, so we are only here to serve you. And she's just, you know, all the pleasantries and making him feel a, like an honored guest. Elton says, give me your hand, bring me, my, bring me to my host, Macbeth. I love him dearly, and I shall continue to favor him whenever you're ready, hostess, and they all exit. Again, they play music, the stage is lit by torches, the butler and various servants carry utensils and dishes and food across the stage. So they're starting, they're going to have a banquet, and they're going to celebrate um, the victory of this battle and everyone's new titles. So now we're at Macbeth. Macbeth is thinking over what's happening here. He's making up, trying to make a decision about what he's going to do. Um, if this business would would really be finished when I did the deed, then it would be best to get it over with quickly. So he's saying, if by killing the king, everything will go to normal, and I'll become king, and it'll be all over, then I should just do it quickly. If the assassination of the king could work like a net, sweeping up everything and preventing any consequence, then the murder would be all and and end all, be all and end all of the whole affair. And I would gladly put my soul and the afterlife at risk to do it. Okay, so he's saying if this was one, like I could just kill the king and move on, and like I said, become king and, and nothing else would happen then I would gladly put my soul and my life after, he says, jump the life to come, meaning um, heaven, right? The idea of being able to go to heaven. Can you go to heaven if you murdered someone? No. Okay? So he's, he knows he's putting that at risk. But for crimes like these, there are still punishments in this world. By committing violent crimes, we only teach other people to commit violence. And the violence of our students will come back and plague us as teachers. Justice, being equal to everyone, forces us to drink from the poisoned cup that we serve to others. The king trusts me in two ways. First of all, I am his kinsman and his subject, so I should always try to protect him. Second, I am his host, meaning he's in, he's in his house, so I should be closing the door in his murderer's face, not trying to murder him myself. Besides, Duncan has been such a humble leader, <clears throat> so free of corruption, that his virtuous legacy will speak for him when he dies, as if angels were playing trumpets against the injustice of murder. Okay, so he's such a humble man that trumpets in the in the heavens will will cry, and and then he says, "Pity like an innocent newborn baby will ride the wind with winged angels." on invisible horses through the air to spread the news of the horrible murder <clears throat> to everyone everywhere. People will shed a flood of tears that will drown the wind like a horrible downpour of rain. I can't spur myself to action. The only thing motivating me is ambition, which makes people rush ahead of themselves toward disaster. Okay, so he's rethinking this idea. And Lady Macbeth enters, and he says to her, What news do you have? And she says, He has almost finished dinner. Why did you leave the dining room? Um, she, he says, Has he asked for me? You know he has. 
We can't go on with this plan, Macbeth tells her. The king has just honored me, and I have earned the good opinion of all sorts of people. I want to enjoy these honors while I, the feeling is fresh, and not throw them away so soon. She says to him, Were you drunk when you seemed so hopeful before? Have you gone to sleep and woken up green and pale in fear of this idea? For now on this, what I'll think of your love. Are you afraid to act the way you desire? Will you take the crown and what you... Will you take the crown you want so badly, and you will live as a coward, always saying, I can't, after you say, I want to? You're like the poor cat in that old story. It says, please stop. I dare to do what is proper for the man for a man to do. He who dares to do more is not a man at all. And then she says to him, if you weren't a man, then what kind of animal were you when you first told me you wanted to do this? When you dared to do it, that's when you were a man. And if you go one step further by doing what you dared to do before, you'll be that much more the man. The time and place weren't right before, but you would have gone ahead with the murder anyway. Anyhow, now the time and place are just right, and they're almost too good for you. I have suckled the baby and I know how sweet it is to love the baby at my breast, but even as the baby was smiling up at me, I would have plucked my nipple out of his mouth and smashed his brains against a wall if I had sworn to do that the same as you, you have sworn to do this. So that's pretty harsh, right? So she's saying to him, if you go back on your word, you're not a man. And she's telling him, I would do, I would kill my own child to get to be to get you to be king. And you're telling me that you, you don't want to do it. And then he turns to her and he says, But if we fail, right? He's afraid. What if we get caught? She yells, We fail. If you get your courage up, we can't fail. And then she tells him the plan. When Duncan is asleep, her plan. The day's hard journey has definitely made him tired. I'll get his two servants so drunk that their memory will go up in smoke through the chimney of their brains. When they lie asleep like pigs, so drunk they'll be dead to the world. What won't you and I be able to do to the unguarded Duncan? And whatever we do, we can lay all the blame on the drunken servants. Okay, so her plan is, we'll get his guards drunk, he'll Duncan will be sleeping, and we'll go in, and we'll murder him, and then we'll blame the guards. So Macbeth says, May you only give birth to male children, because your fearless spirit should create nothing that isn't masculine. Once we have covered the two servants with blood and used their daggers to kill, won't people believe that they were the culprits? Lady Macbeth says, Who could think it happened any other way? We'll be grieving loudly when we hear that Duncan died. Now I'm deciding, and I will exert every muscle in my body to commit this crime. Now, now I'm decided. Go now and pretend to be a friendly hostess. Hide with a false pleasant face what you know in your false evil heart. And then that's it. Okay, so now we go to Act 